My name is Sorrel Dwayne Unruh. I spell that last name U-N-R-U-E. I don't know why, but over the years, a lot of people have trouble spelling it and pronouncing it. I was born in Elkhart, Indiana. That's the northern part of Indiana, not too far from Lake Michigan. I was born in town the day of the stock market crash on Jordan Street. It was uh, about three to four blocks from the Selmer Musical Instrument Manufacturing Company. My dad uh, became an apprentice at Selmer uh, Musical Instrument Company when he was 19 years old. I uh, grew up uh, in uh, times of uh, finding it difficult to have enough to eat. My dad uh, was still working at Selmer's and uh, one winter he uh, came down with scarlet fever and our house was quarantined for I believe like a month and during that time uh, we didn't have hardly much to eat and so the fellow workers at Selmer plant all got together and uh, took a collection and I never will forget hearing this knock on the door so when I open the door, there's no person, but there's this huge pot of hot steaming lima beans and ham. I lived in Elkhart until I was about, uh, I'm going to say, five years old, and then moved to the little town of Syracuse, Indiana, where I went to grade school. And uh, when I lived in Syracuse, my, both my mother and dad worked. And after school, I'd get my bicycle and my cane pole and a can of worms and ride about uh, half a mile down to Turkey Creek. I caught uh, bluegill. After I caught them, I'd clean them and bring them home and put them in a bowl with a little salt and set them in our refrigerator, uh, and then when my mother got home, she'd cook them for supper. Back then, uh, well, my grandparents did not have a telephone, so I couldn't call them and talk to them, so my parents would drive about, uh, I think it was 55 miles, to Kenderville. And I'd spend two weeks with Grandma and Grandpa Nichols, and uh, you'd really get to know your grandparents that way. Then my family moved way out in the Wild West to Abilene, Texas in 1940. At the time, I was 11 years old. My sister would have been nine. Well, I thought it was a great adventure. I had a, a cowboy suit uh, with real fur chaps and a vest and a 10-gallon hat and two cap pistols. And I wanted to see the real West. My dad uh, came to Abilene uh, on a trial basis for six months before he moved our family down. He fell in love with the people and, uh, and was foreman of the uh, musical instrument repair shop for the H.N. White Music Company. I guess my first friend was my old buddy Waldo Mookery. I remember I had a red bicycle Hawthorne brand made by Montgomery Ward and it had just uh, regular red painted fenders.
but my friend Waldo had this super duper bicycle with chrome fenders and the frame was chrome and it had a bell that rang and a basket on it and a luggage carrier on the back. Mine didn't. We were exactly the same age and the first summer after we moved here, uh, my parents uh, encouraged my sister and I to go to vacation Bible school up at the University Baptist Church and uh, then uh, I was interested in Boy Scouting and uh, Waldo was uh, already a Boy Scout so I joined and uh, I ended up being the assistant patrol leader and Waldo was the patrol leader and our patrol was the Buffalo Patrol. I was at Waldo Mutri's house when we heard the news over the radio that uh, the Japanese had uh, secretly attacked Pearl Harbor. It was some pretty scary times. Back then, the Texas State Guard was organized for those that were too young to serve in the military and those that were too old. At the age of 14, uh, Waldo and I joined the Texas State Guard. We were in, uh, issued regular Army uniforms, complete with helmet and uh, a 1917 Enfield 30-06 service rifle. I was promoted to the rank of corporal, and my job was a machine gunner for a 30 caliber uh, Browning water cooled machine gun. John Bonke and his dad both were in the Texas State Guard, and. Uh, uh, John and Walter and I were all buddies, uh, teenagers that uh, thought we were uh, gladiator warriors. Well, the Jolly Boys were formed at Abilene High School during our senior year, and it was made up of about 10 different, well, I'll say the well-mannered, good at heart, uh, Christian type young men. Borden Duffel uh, came up with the name Jolly Boy. And back then that was uh, a group that liked to have fun and that wasn't uh, gay boys, that was Jolly Boys. We had all kinds of fun. It was good, good clean fellowship and uh, of course, every once in a while we did like a beer or two, but, but John Bonke's dad had a cabin out at Lake Fort Phantom, and uh, we would, the group would go out there quite often and spend the weekend and uh, uh, boating and fishing, and we'd play 42 and, and uh, Monopoly with our big game back then. The Jolly Boys was organized in high school. Then after high school, all of us went either uh, off to college or we went in the military. And uh, over the years, we finally all came back to Abilene. And uh, must have been something good about Abilene because everybody came back. When I got ready to uh, go to college, uh, there wasn't student loans available at that time. And uh, I went to Hardin Simmons for one year. I was working part time for the West Texas Utility Company for Mr. E. A. Hollowell. And uh, <coughs> back then, uh, 
practically all the employees of West Texas Utility Company were Texas Aggie graduates. And one day Mr. Hallwell invited me to come into the office and he, he said, uh, uh, Dwayne, uh, have you ever thought about going to Texas A&M? And I said, well, I've thought about it and would like to, but there's no way I can afford to go. My parents can't help me and I don't have enough money to go. And he said, well, young man, just remember this. You can do anything that you set your mind to do. All you got to do is work. W-O-R-K. He said, if you want to go to A&M, I will <clears throat> write a letter to the head of the mechanical engineering department and I will ask him if there's any way that, uh, that he can get me uh, different jobs to earn my way through school. Anyway, uh, through that connection, I was uh, able to get a job uh, waiting tables in Duncan Bass Hall, which I did for four years, three times a day. And I had to get up at five o'clock and be on the job by six. Then I was uh, given uh, two candy and gum machines in the dormitory, which I kept stocked in. I got a 10% commission off of all sales. And then on the ball game, I sold uh, Cokes and hot dogs out of a cold drink stand and made pretty good money at that. And then my senior year, I was given the managership of an entire uh, stand. But anyway, I earned enough money uh, my senior year that when I graduated from a and I owed him $600. And I paid that $600 back within a year. When I got into the Army, uh, I was officially assigned to Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Aberdeen, Maryland, which is the headquarters for the Army Ordnance Corps of Research and Development. And I was trained as a ammunition supply and renovation officer. And uh, I must have done something right because they kept me there for six months as a instructor. And uh, the Korean War was going on. And there was 12 in our class, and six of the 12 went directly to Korea. And of that six that went, only three came back. Fortunately, my assignment as an instructor there kept me uh, from going to Korea until January of 1953. They needed someone with my uh, training uh, in a hurry because the condition of most of the mortar rounds and artillery rounds were in bad shape due to the bad storage conditions in South Korea of, of, uh, due to the humidity of all the rice paddies. I was put on a troop train. Uh, the, the train we were on was just uh, wooden box cars with you sitting on wood seats. Traveled at night and we were given orders to not light cigarettes, turn on flashlights, or even light a cigarette lighter because uh, there had been a sniper of North Korean sniper take shots at this train. I was assigned to the 83rd Ordnance uh, Battalion, which is part of the 3rd Army, and General Maxwell Taylor was the commanding general of the 
uh, Third Army. And then was assigned back to the United States to the Army Ordnance Guided Missile School in Huntsville, Alabama. I went to high school with her and she was in my Sunday school class at St. Paul Methodist Church. I uh, used to go over to her house uh, to square dance. Her mother and dad uh, liked to square dance and they'd uh, move the furniture out of the living room and roll back the carpet and then we'd square dance. And went on Sunday school picnics and the Charlie B and Zan had this ranch down at Brooks Mill and on occasion she and I and uh, two or three others would be guests uh, over the weekend down at the car ranch at Brooks Smith, Texas. While I was in Korea there was a a great need for food and clothing for the uh, Korean children who were orphans. And I would write uh, Jean uh, and she would get together with her Sunday school class and they sent, uh, as I recall, it was five big boxes full of used coats and socks and underwear and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, and somewhere I have pictures of uh, the uh, two houseboys in their warm clothes with a sign they had that said, thank you very much. I married uh, Jean Oates, I think it was June the 1st of uh, 1955. After we married, I was still uh, had it in my head uh, for a, a military career because I really enjoyed it and not bragging, but I was good at it. One day I got a letter from CBO on a very poor typing, but you could make it out eventually. <laughs> And in that, he offered me the opportunity to learn the construction business. I uh, thought about it a long time. I was pretty good at math. I won two uh, awards of merit in high school for mechanical drawing and could read blueprints real well. And this seemed like an ideal opportunity. Well, I started in 1957. The frustrating part was the long hours that I had to work. For years, I did all of our cost estimating to prepare our bids uh, that we would make on mostly commercial jobs. Well, the most satisfying part of it uh, I guess with the experience I had when I bid the um, <coughs> Amy Graves Rhyme of the Fine Arts Center at uh, McMurray College. I was doing all the estimating. The job was to be bid at 10 o'clock one Thursday morning. And since I didn't have any help, I had to put this million dollar bid together and I was signing my name and finishing the last bit of the bid uh, papers at about 10 minutes before 10. I knew I did not have enough time to get in my vehicle and find a parking place. So after I got everything together, I ran out the front door of the office across South 14th Street, down the campus to the administration building, practically out of breath, and when I walked in and handed uh, my bid to the architect, it was two minutes till 10. They read the bids out, 
and I got the job by $1,900. I decided that I wanted to farm. I was, was interested in uh, pecan trees and, and uh, uh, planting and harvesting wheat because I had done it when I was a little kid. I was looking for something out south of Abilene, out around the hills, because I knew there were deer out there, and <laughs> I'd have a place I could deer hunt. So I borrowed, I believe it was around $5,900. Over the years, I paid it off. I did a lot of improvements on the farm. I planted over 300 pecan trees, and that was my, uh, love and joy for years and years and the idea was that by the time I reached a retirement I'd have a good retirement income off of pecans. I built a house that was uh, two story, it was close to 2,000 feet, it was a nice home and that's where I was planning on retirement. Well, everything went great for about uh, 10 to 15 years, and then we ran into seven years of severe drought. My water wells dried up, uh, very little rainfall, I couldn't haul enough water to water all those trees, and I became so disappointed and distraught that I, uh, it worried me so bad every time I went out there and saw all the dead trees that I decided to put it on the market and sold it. I saw a, a dream and a lot of work just go down the drain, but there's nothing I can do about it. My first wife and the mother of all my children uh, died on October the 6th, 1983, and uh, it was a horrible experience to go through. And uh, I uh, really, really was heartbroken, and I uh, was faced with what to do with the rest of my life. Anyway, I felt deserted, so to speak, and I was out at the farm on a Saturday uh, picking pecans up 
this was before the drought. And uh, I just broke down and uh, not ashamed to say that I cried and cried and cried. And it came in and I was uh, home in a uh, empty, cold house and uh, uh, just really was shook up. And I got down on my hands and knees and uh, cried out to the good Lord, uh, why have you forsaken me? Why have I had to go through all this? Prior to this, I had been going to Al-Anon uh, to try to get over the sorrow of the, the divorce. And uh, there was a counselor who told me about uh, this uh, friend of hers who was uh, really an attractive young lady. Uh, who was a divorcee that, and um, <clears throat> uh, that she was really a wonderful Christian lady and she had the most beautiful hands. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. But the, the point of my story is that when I cried out to God about being forsaken and why I had to go through all this, there was a, not an audible voice, but my conscience, I guess you'd say, uh, answered, number one, I'd not been forsaken, and number two, you get up early Sunday morning, put on your toupee, put on your pinstripe suit, and go to St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Well, that's what I did. And I didn't know what Luana looked like or who she was or anything, but I went to the back door of the church when there was a, a fellow standing there and uh, he said, uh, can I help you? And I said, well, yeah, I'm, uh, do you know Luana Fornoy? And he said, yeah, sure, she's in Sunday school class. You want me to go get her? Anyway, about that time, uh, Sunday school was over and all the classes were coming to Fellowship Hall for this dinner. And uh, uh, Thompson said, that's her right over there, that little short gray-haired lady. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, uh, would you mind going over and, and telling her that there's someone that would like to talk to her? So it, motioned me over. I looked down at her and she looked up at me and, and um, uh, she said, well, uh, do I know you? And I said, well, no, you really don't, but there's a mutual friend of mine that wanted us to meet. I was uh, sort of a fast operator. Right? <laughs> so anyway, Juana uh, said, well, uh, would you like to have lunch with me? And we had a lovely uh, lunch and discussed just things in general. And uh, after lunch was over, she said, well, uh, would you like to go to the service with me? And I said, well, yeah, sure. But I was a Methodist and I didn't know anything about Episcopalian ritual. And she coaxed me on how to kneel before you go into the pew and, and uh, the prayer book and all that. Then uh, uh, she gave me her phone number. Not that she was being forward, but I gave her my phone number and we started uh, talking to each other uh, once or twice a week on the phone. Then we decided, uh, well, uh, how about meeting at the church on Wednesday night at choir practice and we could just sit on the bench, a bench and visit. 
and we did that for oh, two or three months. I think this was in September that we first met, and by uh, by Christmas I was well uh, impressed enough to borrow a James Avery Gold Cross, and that kind of impressed me. <laughs> But anyway, uh, it's turned out to be a, a wonderful 27 years of marriage.